gorgeous sun-drenched Saturday afternoon in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The Crimson Tide begins its 2012 season. Spring football, A-Day, Bama style here at the Capstone. Welcome to Bryant Denny, everybody, along with former Bama quarterback Tyler Watts. I'm Chris Stewart. So glad to have you with us. Yes, it is the unofficial start to 2012. Although when you talk to the fans coming in here, Tyler, clearly their minds are still on 2011. It is, and it should be. There's an old adage in football. You just play hard till the whistle blows. Let things happen, and things will work out. After that, that loss to LSU here in Bryant Denny, we didn't think it was going to end very good. Came home with a national championship. The ball went our way the rest of the, the rest of the season across the country, and Alabama won that 14th national championship. It's awfully special, but if they're going to match what they did a season ago, they're going to have to fill in some key gaps in the middle, both offensively and defensively. We'll start on the defensive side, where Jesse Williams goes from defensive end to trying to clog the middle. And in this 3-4 defensive scheme that Alabama has run for several years, it all starts with the nose guard. He has to be able to occupy both those gaps around the center so that the linebackers can make the tackles. Jesse Williams has a tall order here this year. Trying to replace Josh Chapman, who was so good for the last couple of seasons. And then on the offensive side, you lose William Vallejos in center, but you replace him with the top offensive lineman, the Outland Award winner from a year ago at left tackle in Barrett Jones. And one of the smartest guys on this football team. He's played so many different positions in his career at Alabama. Both left guard, left tackle, now center. Be interesting to see how he controls that line with the communication because he is such a good teacher and a good communicator. As we said, it is a new season, a new mindset, hoping for old results. And for more on that, we welcome in the third member of our crew, Nikki Noto. Thanks, Chris. Well, I had the opportunity yesterday to sit down with Coach Saban, and guys, I simply asked him, what are you wanting to accomplish at A-Day? And he told me, well, first and foremost, you guys dabbled on it a little bit earlier. He said it is important for you to understand that this is a new year. This is a new team. These guys that are out here playing on the field today, they are not the ones that went into the so Superdome and brought home that national championship trophy. He said it is critical that these guys, they have to discover their own identity. They have to improve that mindset in order to really get ready for the fall. Chris? Thank you, Nikki. We look forward to checking in with you throughout the course of our broadcast today. Alabama splitting up, half crimson, half white, all with the same goal, getting better as they wrap up spring drills here with A-Day in Tuscaloosa. We're back with more right after this here on CSS, your source for Southeast sports. Beautiful Bryant Denny Stadium, 101,821 seats, capacity. It'll be just a few shy of that here today, but you'll have more people here for a spring scrimmage than the majority of the country has for a fall Saturday afternoon. Head coach Nick Saban getting his team ready for a sixth season in five years in Tuscaloosa. Team at BCS National Championships. You see three total titles, and he is already in mid-season form in terms of of patrolling things as the commissioner <laughs> today for our spring game. Oh, but he definitely has a hands-on type of uh, style as far as being a commissioner because you're going to see him, what was it, a couple years ago he got rolled up in the backfield. That was entertaining, I think, a lot for the players too. The, the drop step is something that he worked on a little <laughs> bit more after that. But gorgeous weather here in Tuscaloosa, 8A, 80 degrees, slight breeze, a little bit of humidity, but absolutely perfect for a spring scrimmage here at the University of Alabama. You will have running, uh, four quarters, excuse me, with a running clock, with the exception of the last four minutes of the second and fourth quarter. So you'll have some real similarities after penalties and after scoring plays, the clock itself will stop. But by and large, it is going to be a uh, running clock here as Cade Foster will kick off. You saw Christian Jones. One of the return men, and it will be a now sophomore out of Minor High School who will return the kick. And as you can tell, there is no live tackling in kick coverage here today. A couple of the rule changes we'll be talking about. Kickoffs occurring from a different location and some changes on the touchback rules we'll be looking at a little bit later as our broadcast continues as well. But at quarterback for the Crimson Tide, the young man who led Alabama to a 
national championship in the BCS title game in the Superdome just a few months ago. A.J. McCarron, what a season he had and the improvement from being a contender for the starting spot going into the first week to being the guy that was the offensive MVP in that title game, something special to watch. Yeah, it was fun to watch him grow over the course of the year and just how mature he got. He had some help in the receiving core as well, but the secondary comes up with a pick on the very first play. Robert Lester roaming the secondary, and it's a defense that lost some key players, Tyler, but he is one of the key members that are indeed back for 2012. Karen tried to find Kenny Bell on a little little post route, a little corner route, rather. You can see Lester coming back. What a, He had an outstanding 2009 season with the interceptions. And last year kind of fell off. I think a lot of offenses were scared to throw his direction. But they're back in uh, the old form that we remember Robert Lester being in. Lester, a second team All-American, according to the Walter Camp Foundation a year ago. Phillip Sims is the starter for the white team today. And he has been somewhat limited in drills thus far. But bumps off the pass there as the catch is made by the white team's Brent Calloway. Working some at tight end this spring. Tremendous running back as well as linebacker in high school, but moved to tight end. And again, some of the moves that we see in the spring are not permanent, Tyler. These are experimental, but Alabama looking for bodies in different spots. And Brent Calloway, a very versatile athlete. He has done that. Start off at running back because that's where he wanted to play, but he's been willing to kind of move around and find, the, find a home. DeAndre White. Again, it's a receiving core that is not going to have the, the marquee name as the one two years ago when he had Julio Jones. It does not have Marquise Mays. It does not uh, have Darius Hanks back. But you've got a number of guys who played key minutes last year who also had some big catches in that BCS title game. And, and they really came on when needed. Remember when Darius Hanks went down versus Mississippi State, it was young guys filling in with Marquise Mays in the championship game. Young guys filling in, making big plays. So now it's their opportunity uh, for the spotlight. Speaking of young guys, T.J. Yeldon out of Daphne, Alabama. One of the top prospects in the country at running back. And again, you don't have Trent Richardson. You don't have the guy from two years ago in Mark Ingram, but you've got some real depth. And even though Eddie Lacy, because of uh, surgery on the toe that had limited him throughout a good bit of last year, did not participate uh, real heavily in spring drills at all, you've still got a lot of competition and a lot of talent in that backfield this year. There, there really is, and they continue to push one another. And these, honestly, these are guys that and give them a year, give them a couple of games. They're going to become the big name guys on the on this football team. Sims with pressure coming, and the quarterback is not available <laughs> to, to get clocked. And I know they're happy about that as you see Quentin Dial, big number 90, coming in to make that stop. Dial, a big part of the defense a year ago that was among the best in the country, holding teams to just eight and a half points per game. Just right up the middle, use a little swim move to get into the backfield. Jeffrey Pagan also doing a good job from the edge of applying that pressure. Tyler, among the things people are keeping an eye on this year, the change at offensive coordinator Doug Nussmeyer uh, coming in onto the staff as the new offensive coordinator and I don't think you'll see a lot of things changing from what we've seen the past couple of years as that one is dumped off once again to Yeldon, and he gets a good bit of that yardage back that was lost from the previous play. And that, that's a great point, Chris, because I'm, I'm sure that the, the terminology and the playbook itself is probably, if not exactly the same, pretty, pretty close. What is going to change, though, is the philosophy and style of play with the change of coordinator. When do we run? When do we throw? Of course, a lot of that's also going to come from the direction of, of today's commissioner, Mr. Saban. But there is going to be a different feel for the game, and, and that is something that the players will continue to adapt to as well as understanding all right, what's coming next. What, what do we normally do? What's our tendency here? Third and about a dozen for Sims with time, dumping it off, and the catch is made, but slipping down was Chris Black, wide receiver for the Crimson Tide. One of those freshmen out of Jacksonville, Florida, played at First Coast High School, 5'11", 178. So the Crimson team will have to punt and handle those duties. Cody Mandel in a solid season last year on the national championship team. Christian Jones, who had to 
serve as the return man on the punt situations in the title game after Marquise May suffered the hamstring injury. Did such a great job of just making sure he fielded the football. It sounds real simple, yeah. but in the title game with all of that pressure and a guy who had not had a lot of returns, his solid play, awfully, awfully important. It, it, it was. Talk about getting thrown into the fire, so to speak. I mean, he just went in was, and was flawless building those and then you could see also he fair, fair caught the first one or so and then he actually returned one for 10 15 yards so you can see you saw his ability in that championship game and I know that he's looking forward to being able to bring those talents to the field this year. So McCarron working from the gun and they'll give it to Johnston Fowler. And he will rumble his way every time he carries the football it seems for at least five yards and he's a, a guy who a year ago, Tyler, that was maybe fifth or sixth on the depth chart going into spring drills, but because of injuries, transfers, he worked his way up and was a big part of what this uh, offense was able to do. I actually had one of the better averages of all the three backs running. Of course, some of his play was towards the end of the game, but talk about a, a big bruising back that is able to lower his shoulders and, and really punish some of the defensive guys. That's Jalston Fowler. Goes north and south, but it reminds everybody, hey, you know, I got a little speed. I get to the outside. It is just not what you think of with him. You think of four yards, five yards, and beaten, battered bodies left along the wayside when, when he gets through. But third and a yard upcoming here. This is where it's interesting to, to, to watch Jesse Williams there at the nose guard position. How does he handle the initial push? I think he did a pretty good job. Talk about the adjustments for Barrett Jones going from being a guy who has played everywhere on the offensive line, but now at center replacing William Vallejos, who's one of the top in his position in the country. But what skill set does Jones bring that allows him to make that move to the center? Side? I think his feet are just so good, and he's always – his center gravity, is, his weight is always underneath him. So he's able to go any direction. He's always keeping his shoulders square. You just don't seem to make a lot of mental mistakes there. And, and I think that that's what the coaching staff really loves about him. The fact they can trust him and they know what to what they're going to get out of him on every play. Outland Award winner, top offensive lineman of the country, the Jacobs Blocking Award for the SEC. In fact, he received that honor just prior to the start of A Day. Receiving that from head coach Nick Saban. And he's not your prototype now at center that big frame that we talk about normally you've got a lower center of gravity but you talk about what he's able to do and, and still able to compensate if you will just just plays within himself is the biggest thing and you just don't see him make a lot of mistakes and quarterbacks love offensive linemen that don't make many middle, middle mistakes Kevin Norwood making that grab and the tide will have or the crimson <laughs> I should say will have third and about 14. All right. As fans, everybody's out here to watch this game and enjoy it. As a player, how intense was the spring game itself? Intense. It was a drain, I always thought. Uh, it was, you know, obviously the 15th practice, and we were ready to get it all over with so you could get back into summer conditioning and start working. But it's, it, it's fun because you start feeling the excitement and the juices flow again simply because of the fan base that comes and supports these games. Do have a flag on the play. Tom Ritter is the referee for today's game. Again, could be overruled at any moment. And that actually is one of two referees that they are alternating. That is actually David Smith, former quarterback for the University of Alabama. And of course, in regular season games, alumni are not allowed to work their own uh, their own former schools ball game right. so you see a lot of former Alabama players I believe Lamont Russell is among those that are officiating today's game former tight end and receiver for the tide but David Smith making that call as the fair catch is made by the white team's Dion Blue white team will have it when we come back no score at the moment here on a day in the first quarter in Tuscaloosa on CSS, 8A in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, along with Tyler Watts and our sideline reporter, Nikki Noto. I'm Chris Stewart. Glad to have you with us in Tuscaloosa as the white team faced with third down and about four. Phillip Sims, the quarterback. T.J. Yeldon 
is the single setback as they operate out of the shotgun, same as they did many times with Jim McElwain as the offensive coordinator. Now Doug Nussmeyer in charge of the offense, and you almost had an interception there. Travell Dixon able to come over and get a hand on that one and almost got two hands and the pick. Jarek Williams also in there doing a great job coming down. Just not, and we really haven't seen too many opportunities all game, or at least in this quarter to this point, for the quarterbacks to throw the ball downfield. We saw A.J. McCarron do it there on the first play from skim, scrimmage inter, inter, intercepted is what pursued, but we haven't seen the ball push down the field a whole lot. What a, what a great testament to the DBs on both sides. Christian Jones with the fair catch. So the Crimson taking over once again. Tyler, it's a team that a year ago wins a national championship with a 12-1 record, but they lose five starters back on offense, four of them from defense, a couple of specialists lost from a year ago as well. Start, number seven on the offense, penalty is five yards. Still first down, number seven. And receives the penalty there against Kenny Bell will back him up five yards. You, you can't replace what was lost defensively, or can you, here at Alabama well, now? We, we make this point every year, this argument, is the fact that every single year you're, you're losing great talent. But what is so different over the last several years as opposed to in years past is the fact that there's so much talent coming in every single year to replace it. So the names might be different, but the abilities are there. Beautiful throw and catch there. McCarron connected with Christian Jones, and you see him be able to turn those shoulders and move the ball downfield as well. A first down to the 41-yard line of the white team. And then what happens is, is after a year or two of, of running and getting in shape and, and working out, guys start getting bigger, start uh, adjusting to the speed of the game here at the college level and they're not thinking so much. They're able just to go out and play. And there's a young, uh, a nice example right there of Christian Jones, who a couple of early opportunities last year, and then as he continued to play, got more and more confidence, and now he's playing faster. And there you saw big number 54, Jesse Williams, out of Aust uh, Brisbane, Australia, able to record the sack there. And again, where he's lined up now, over the football. His numbers may not be as spectacular as a year ago, but that's not what Nick Saban asked for the guy that clogs the middle, whether it was Terrence Cody from a few years ago, whether it was Josh Chapman for the last couple of years. This is a guy who's asked to clog things up the middle and allow other guys to make plays. But one thing that he's able to do that, that those guys you just mentioned couldn't do is he's still 320, still a big body to able to clog up a lot in the middle. He can move them. And, you know, he's, that's not all he can do is just clog. He can actually do moves on offensive line and get to the backfield, as we saw in the prior play, and, and really cause havoc. And that's just a nightmare for an offensive coordinator because you basically have to, to commit two guys to keep tabs on your, on your nose guard at all times. And what does that do? Well, hey, that frees up a linebacker. Damian Square in the middle now on the wide side along with D.J. Petway. As you'll have third and about a dozen. Set up the screen to Fowler, and that is read extremely well. Looked like Lester came flying in. Check that, I'm sorry. 3-3, three, three. Trey DePriest, who a year ago out of Springfield, Ohio, as a freshman, we saw some flashes of what made him one of the top linebacking prospects of the country. That's two big bodies hitting each other right there. Trey DePriest is going to be a guy that's really got to come on this year. Very quickly, the first quarter comes to a close. No score, the Crimson and the White taking part in 8 a here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. White the punt there, down at the one. A 43-yard punt that time from Cody Mandel. So the White team having to start in the shadow of their own end zone here in quarter number two. This is one of those situations you work on in practice all the time, Tyler, but now when you've got several thousand people inside the stadium, it takes on a little bit different look. 
It, it does, and there you see the result right there. You give a defense an opportunity to get down close to that goal line, and they just they smell blood in the water, and they're going to attack, attack, attack. That is a very pleasant sight for Alabama fans. Number 32, C.J. Mosley, quickly closing in. When he left on a cart during the BCS National Championship game, everybody thought the worst. It looked like a leg injury. It was actually his hip. But C.J. Mosley, one of those guys expected to step in and take on even more of a leadership role now that the Tide has lost some key players, such as the one that joins our Nikki Noto right now. All right, guys, right now I have the one and only Dante Hightower with me. Dante, how's it feel to be back in Tuscaloosa for A-Day? Um, it's great, man, great fans. Um, looking forward to watching some of the other guys come out, show, show everybody what they got and what they got going into the, to the season. Speaking of other guys, I talked to Nico Johnson yesterday, and I was asking him, um, you know, how excited he is to really emerge as a leader now that you and Courtney are gone. What do you think about Nico's progression and heading into this year as a leader? Uh, I don't think it's going to be any problem at all for Nico. You, I mean, just being around him for as long as he's been here, um, you can just kind of get a feed off his character and personality. You know, he has, he has that, you know, in his personality to come up and be a natural born leader. And, uh, you know, so far it's been, you know, him and uh, Robert Lester and Adrian Hubbard, you know, just going back talking to those guys about practice. A lot of those guys have stepped up a lot, so, um, you know, there's no, no problem at all. He's going to have to step and be a leader. And I have to ask you, the draft is just a few weeks away. What have you been doing to mentally and physically prepare you for the big day? Uh, I've really been ripping and running through different airports every other day, so I've been traveling a lot. But uh, I think I'm about done. I might have one or two more. But uh, in between that, I'm trying to get a workout in here and there so my body doesn't get too bad. All righty. Excited to go to New York? Oh, yeah. We're really looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks, Dante. Back to you guys in the booth. Thanks, guys. Uh, Tyler Dante Hightower expected to be a first-round draft pick. They're talking about the Steelers with the 24th pick, the Patriots at number 27, and the Ravens at number 29. At 6'2", 265, great versatility, toughness to overcome a, uh, a knee injury from earlier in his Alabama career, and, and great to see him uh, be projected as such a high pick, and also great to have a guy like Nico Johnson that can step in and fill that void with his departure to the NFL. You know, and, and Nico's a guy that's been playing off and on since his freshman year, since he arrived on campus uh, two years ago. So, you know, that seems to kind of be the thing. It's more of a passing of the torch of who's going to take the reins and, and really run this thing because so many of these players are playing early, and they have some experience to lead. Dante Hightower, Drake Kirkpatrick, Courtney Upshaw, Mark Barron, Trent Richardson, all expected to have their names called in the first round of that NFL draft that Nikki alluded to just moments ago. And incredible to think that we're just, what, five, six years ago that Alabama did not have a player drafted, and now you could have as many as five and go in the first round. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. That just really shows how the recruiting efforts have paid off. And, and not only are we recruiting well, but we're also coaching them up when, we get, when they get here. Player development among the things that Coach Nick Saban and his staff do so incredibly well. D. Hart, young man who... Again, was expected to be a part of the offense a year ago, but suffered a knee injury in preseason, uh, really off-season drills. And fought his way through that, has got himself ready to go. There were, there were whispers that he might show up in the final weeks of the regular season. But again, you don't want to yank that red shirt off of a guy that late. And, and Coach Saban wanted to make sure that he was mentally and physically 100% ready to go before they put him back on the field. And certainly throughout spring, he's been among the uh, bright spots. And that, that's really probably where it shows up more than anything is just the physical aspect. And as a player, you can, several months after a knee injury, you can feel like you're 100%. But you, you get out there, and then the competitive juices get going once again, and you try to do something, you realize, I'm not quite there, so it is always better to be a little bit more cautious, especially with a guy who has as much talent as D. Hart. Great speed. I think he's going to bring a dimension to the backfield that as good as, as Ingram and, and Richardson have been, this guy is, uh, is the real burner that they are so excited about from an offensive standpoint. Here's Deion Blue fielding the fair catch. Another good kick from Cody Mandel. It's time now for our Cook's Pest Control thorough inspection of the Alabama Crimson Tide. And we talked about this a little bit in the open, Tyler, but if you had one area that you're looking for to, to find Alabama uh, filling in a gap from a year ago, what's your primary concern? This is where it really gets tough is, is the linebackers 
a lot of new names because you missed the Courtney Upshaw and the Dante Hightower, but you're replacing them with guys like C.J. Mosley and Nico Johnson and Trey DePriest who have a lot of game experience. So it's tough to really just say it's the linebackers, but I know this. When, the, when those linebackers and defensive linemen are going up against the, the wealth of experience that the offensive line brings to play every, day, every single practice, I mean, is there, there's, there's not a better preparation for those guys in getting better and getting that experience than going up against this offensive line. That's your team inspection brought to you by Cook's Best Control and Central Con. Call Cook's for a free pest and termite evaluation. Second down and about nine upcoming. Philip Ely in at quarterback for the Crimson Tide. The man who redshirted last year, Tyler. 6'1", 198, out of Plant High School in Tampa, Florida. Again, solid skills, and, and you cannot have enough depth at that quarterback. Alabama has been fortunate, by and large, with injuries for the last couple of years, but you're always one hit away from having guys see their role change dramatically. And one of the scariest things for a head coach and an offensive coordinator is, is, is thinking or being under the impression that you have to change everything that you do if you were to lose your quarterback. And I think that this coaching staff feels very confident in, in both Phillip Sims, who is still battling for, for a starting position, as well as is, is Ely. Callaway on the receiving end of that throw. And Ely's a guy that, just from a physical standpoint, I think a lot of people are reminded of Greg McElroy. You know, maybe the skills that, that you're looking at don't necessarily blow you away, but a guy that just finds a way to get the job done. And doesn't make mistakes. That's so important at this level, and especially in this conference. Able to dump that one off. To one of his tight ends, that is Harrison Jones, 6'4", 244. Yes, the younger brother of Barrett Jones, but making a name for himself out of Germantown, Tennessee. And he's another guy that's really developed in the offseason and, and over the course of last year, just physically. Uh, maybe little, little late last year, a little undersized still, but continues to put on the weight. And I know that uh, everyone is excited about the prospects of what he brings. 15-yard pickup. Another first down as they'll give it to Yeldon this time. It shows great balance working the sideline there and just a little bit of why he was one of the top recruits in the country from just a few months ago, an early enrollee here at the University of Alabama. Yeah, came in in January and, and really just committed to Alabama a couple of days before signing day. And then, uh, and then came on board in January, and has really, really has an opportunity here in the spring. In the spring, with Eddie Lacy not getting as many reps to, to uh, be able to come out and get some experience. Mr. Football in the state of Alabama, first team All State pick by the Alabama Sports Writers Association, and a USA Today High School All American, five star prospect by every Illegal rating service. On the defense, penalty is five yards. And while you never really want to see mistakes for Nick Saban and their staff, they probably don't mind seeing a couple because it gives them a little something to gnaw on <laughs> as they go into the, into the off-season work. Anybody that thinks Coach will be happy with anything less than perfection may have missed the only penalty call in that BCS title game. Uh. Wilson Love makes this play for the Crimson team. He's another nose guard. A little undersized on the defensive line, but has a motor like none other. And that's, that's Tyler Love's little brother as well out of Mountain Brook, Alabama. But another guy that, kind of like Nick Gentry several years ago, has an opportunity to come in in certain situations and because of that motor and that heart that he has, be able to contribute. There you see Eddie Lacy again is expected to be the number one guy when fall camp gets going a lot of you know from a a fans expectation standpoint fans are sitting there going well we've had Ingram we've had Trent Richardson Eddie Lacy is, is not those guys he's incredibly talented but he's also going to have I think a great supporting cast around him. It, it's going to be some different looks that Alabama will be able to throw 
uh, at opposing defenses in terms of the style of running backs that are going to be worked out there. Well, Mark, in all fairness, though, Mark and Trent weren't the same type of running back either. Every running back brings a little something different to the table. And, uh, you know, Eddie Lacy definitely has his abilities and, and the opportunity. He's got that spin move he uses when running the ball. And, but he's a very good wide receiver as well. So I don't, I don't think you're going to see a ton of change in what they try to do offensively. But you're right, it is a little bit different because we have not seen Eddie Lacy at this point just lower his head and run over somebody. Cade Foster with the long field goal try and able to boot it through. So Foster with a 48-yard field goal try, able to convert. And we got points on the board. The white team with a nice drive and Foster with a long kick. You can tell that one felt good. Kick inside his own 10-yard line here on A Day in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And again, live tackling not taking place on the kicks as Kate Foster was able to boot one through from 48 yards a very welcome sight last year Foster just two of nine on field goal attempts but in fairness he was the guy that was called on to try the longer kicks Jeremy Shelley the uh, the one that would handle kicks primarily inside of 40 yards and went 21 of 27 but Foster with a good leg he's had a good camp and able to step up and with a lot of folks in the building Able to knock one through. McCarron back in at quarterback for the Crimson. Dumps that one off to Dehart, and he is leveled almost immediately. Gain of a couple of yards after Robert Lester delivers the hit. And the defensive backfield was kind of a, a, a question that I really wanted to watch today to see how some of these younger corners would be able to play. And you see John Fulton in there, as well as Dean Miller doing a great job downfield, forcing A.J. McCarron to check the ball down. So with three wide outs in D. Hart, the lone setback. Karen working under center at the moment. And Vinny Sanceri comes knifing in from the edge, able to deliver the first hit. Vinny, a guy who was used primarily in special teams and played a lot in the secondary a year ago, but really where he made his mark was with some sensational hits. He had kick coverage. And uh, again, asked to do more, and he has earned the opportunity for a different role this year. Another guy that's just really spends a lot of time up there at the complex, just studying the game, studying his responsibility, as well as everybody else, because communication is so important in these style of defenses. Of course, he is a coach's son, although his dad's no longer a part of the Alabama staff, as Jones is able to reel that catch in. Setting up third down, or actually fourth down upcoming. But Sal Sinceri, who had been part of Nick Saban's staff for the last few seasons, moving on to become defensive coordinator at the University of Tennessee, and that allowed Lance Thompson to come back for his third tenure in Tuscaloosa. He had worked on Coach Saban's staff during the 07 and 08 years, and then comes back serving as linebacker coach here in 2012. Again, Mandel on to punt with Dion Blue set to return. Another booming kick off the foot of Mandel, and this one will carry into the end zone, but you can tell he has added some leg strength from last season. A little breeze at his back, doesn't hurt either, but a 66-yard punt that time from Cody Mandel. Hey, we'll take those all day, won't we? You can see the excitement right there on his face. Is also averaged about 39 yards per, per punt last year. I think over the course of the spring, though, he has increased that up to around 42. So that's that's in, in line in about average what all the other punters in the SEC are doing. So if you can pick up an extra three yards, Alabama has the speed to get down there and cover it. And that can really uh, cause some problems for opposing offenses. Those yardage, that, that yardage adds up over time. It will be a little different in kick situations this year as Philip Ely again will lead the right team on this drive to give to Yeldon. For about three or four yards. Punch that carry into the end zone. The touchback will still bring the ball out to the 20, but on kickoffs, kicking off from the 35 as opposed to the 30. But kicks that are not returned out of the end zone will actually come out to the 25 yard line now. They're trying to avoid some of the collisions that we have seen in the past, a lot of injuries that occur on kick returns. So a rule that has been changed as he almost had an interception there. Boy, it looked like 
Bradley Silv was going to be able to step in and make that pick. It went just beyond his reach, but he certainly broke on this one very nicely. Silva sat and Ely just wanted to get the ball out there, tried to do it on time. But you can see right there, he sat on the on the play. And another example, though, of a younger wide receiver, Amari Cooper, possibly not creating that separ separation. And a lot of that just comes down to we don't think that you're going to run past us. So I'm going to sit on it. Well, in high school, these, these guys haven't been able to, to run. Not many people have run past them. You know, so much speed. And Cooper out of Miami. Again, fighting for a lot of opportunities at the receiver slot. The Andrew White, another who last year made his mark as a freshman. Defense. Pretty much the order of the day thus far as we're under four minutes to go in this quarter. And while it's been a running clock throughout the majority of this scrimmage, it will be a clock that will stop in the last four minutes of both the second and fourth quarters as, again, Jones will have a chance to feel this one. Let's see where they spot it. I think Tide fans are looking forward to seeing him in the open field with live tackling once the season gets underway. It will be exciting because he has so much explosive ability. It's CSS's second annual Fans' Choice game presented by Regions Bank. Which SEC baseball matchup would you like to see us broadcast live on May 11th? You can vote now at css-sports.com. Chris Stewart, Tyler Watts, down on the sidelines, Nikki Noto, glad to have you with us here on CSS for A Day in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 2011 BCS National Champion Crimson Tide, getting things going during their spring game in 2012. Justin Fowler stood up. It's a sentence that's not uttered very often. There were a lot of guys in white jerseys there to greet him. Ed Stinson getting credit for the initial hit. And again, it's it's a defense that while you lose guys to the National Football League, Tyler, you do replace them with great talent and guys that earned opportunities over the course of the last year or two. You're not asking a ton of blue chip guys to step in and play starting roles right from the beginning. They may they may have different roles this year, but these are not first-year guys that are being called on. No, and the, and the talent that they go against on a daily basis, of what they're competing against, not only against other players at their position, which pushes them, but also across the, the ball, the offense, really forces these guys to get better. And, and it gives them the best looks and allows them to play with that confidence of when they go against an opponent. And, I mean, it truly is. It, it's no different than practice if it's even that tough. Quite the play by Vinny Sinceri just moments ago in the open field against Justin Fowler. He got fourth and about a foot up coming here. They'll give it to number 45 and take their chances. And I'm not surprised to see him go for it right there and challenge what one of the offensive linemen, Anthony Steen, said he feels like has a chance to be the best in the country. And you look at the experience gained over the last couple of years, the number of games these guys have played and the success they've had, they do have an opportunity to be among the best in the country as you'll see a player having to hobble off. That is Ed Stinson right there, the junior out of Homestead, Florida. You never want to see that, but it's the absolute last thing you want to see in a spring game. On the last practice, you're right. Didn't see when it happened or how it happened, but you certainly see him putting a little bit of weight on there. Karen through the hands of Fowler. And again, we talk about what he does between the tackles and his bruising style of running. He does have good hands, and he catches the ball out of the backfield, but not able to bring that one in. A little bit on his backside shoulder. It would have been an awfully tough catch for, for Jostin to have made. We've seen both quarterbacks really forced to throw the flat a lot, trying to push the ball down to the field, but just really nowhere to go. So second and 10 for the white team, 49. It's the white squad with a 3-0 lead here in this scrimmage. Looking deep, looking for Kenny Bell, and he is able to reel it in. 
Boy, he and John Fulton were there step for step, but Bell able to get a little separation, a gorgeous throw from McCarron, and able to bring that in inside the 20. This is a beautiful route by Kenny Bell and a well-placed ball by McCarron. Bell didn't cut himself off again. Plenty of room on the outside so he could adjust to the ball after it was thrown, and that's what created the separation. John Fulton just couldn't close that gap quick enough. 32-yard pickup as we've got a minute 40 to go in the half. McCarron looking. Fowler could not hang on to it. Trey DePriest in coverage. It was a pretty good throw, but great coverage as well by DePriest. Yeah, it was all right there. and Another, another would have been a great catch by Jason Fowler, but one he knows he should have brought in. So second and ten. From right around the 17-yard line. That ball definitely should have been caught. She quarterbacks always think that. Well, it hit his hands. Looking for the corner, Jones. Does he make the catch? He does, and stays in bounds for a touchdown for the Crimson team. Well, Tyler, I didn't think he had any chance of making that grab and getting the feet down, but he does in the corner for the first touchdown of A-Day. Well, McCarron throws this ball flat. He, he knows he's got plenty of room, and it's double coverage on the inside, so he leads him all the way to the, to the, to the sideline. <laughs> what a catch right there. He didn't get two in, but it only takes one. Among the differences in the college and the pro game, you're right, the one foot, all that he needed. As on to try the extra point, Jeremy Shelley. Able to boot that one through, and the Crimson team able to take a 7-3 lead as we take a look at the replay again. Quite a grab. That, that's not an easy catch for a wide receiver, catching it down around his knees, because a lot of times you'll see them actually punch the ball out with their knee when they're trying to continue to run. Great concentration by Christian Jones. And correcting myself, forgot about the safety earlier. It is indeed 9-3 to three for the Crimson squad. As McCarron really kind of run the two-minute offense there. Tyler, a couple of drops, but very solid numbers after throwing a pick on one of the first plays of the game. Yeah, he's taking care of the football. He hadn't forced it downfield anymore, but he's still been aggressive when, when he had his opportunities. Two-minute drill. That's all it took. Any difference in doing this in a spring game as opposed to just one of your regular scrimmages? The two-minute drill? Yeah. Uh, or a little, any, a little any more any at stake it. here. You know, the guys are literally at stake. Yeah. Stake and oh, beans. That's true. But is there a difference in the pressure you feel? I think that you get a better grasp of it because of the atmosphere with the fans and all. And, uh, yeah, I think that it's a little different just simply because of the environment and the surroundings. It says a lot, but, you know, th this is a football team that over the last several years has never felt pressure when put in a two-minute position. They've, they've always been able to move the football and have felt very at ease, very comfortable. They, they run a lot of what you might call hurry up or two minute early in a ball game. Mm -hmm. So when you've when you've done that and you're not relying on it just at the end of a quarter or a half or a, a, uh, a ball game, it is uh, it is something you're much more comfortable with. Right, but, but mentally it, it can be different, but I think that's what a huge testament is coaching staff also is, is really and the players as well is Everybody wants to treat an eight-yard pass as an eight-yard pass, regardless of if it's the first quarter or the last play of the game. But the reality of it is, mentally it's not because of the pressures. And these players just have uncanny ability just to disregard the situation and simply play the game. Ely unloading that with the intended receiver with Sheldon out of the backfield. I remember the first time we saw Mark Ingram. For, for many people, the first time they saw him, not on a practice field, but actually at the Georgia Dome. And just phys the, the physical stature of that guy, it's the same type of 
eye popping. <laughs> I guess surprise you have when you see a guy like T.J. Yeldon and, and uh, how developed he is just as a freshman. And uh, you know it was the same type of reaction we saw when Trent Richardson stepped on the field for the first time, and he now joins our Nicky Noto. All right, guys, right now I am with Trent Richardson. Trent, has it sunk in yet that you're no longer going to be suiting up for the Crimson Tide? I'm thinking it's starting to, uh, it, it's, it's, it don't even feel right being out here and watching these um, football players out here and go out here and, you know, and have fun, you know, without me being out there. It, it's kind of, you know, crazy to me to not be in a Bama uniform. Right. Now walk me through that national championship. I mean, with everything happened between Alabama, LSU, going into the Superdome and ultimately walking away with the national championship, what was that like for you? Uh, I was one of the best ones in the world, man. Uh, you really can't describe it because, um, I mean, it's a once-a-lifetime thing. People, people just don't go out and win two national championships. I mean, and have one, you know, to go out on one and just know that, you know, in my head I got to make a decision that I'm going to leave or not. I mean, but it couldn't be no other way to have to go out with two national championships and, you know, to be a big part of being a big part of both of them, I mean, especially this last one. Uh, having all the touchdown national championship game was big for me. I think that sets you up pretty nicely for the draft that's coming up. And I was talking to Dante earlier. What have you been doing to mentally and physically preparing yourself to get ready for that big day? Uh, really just being around family, just, you know, just staying grounded, just, you know, being humble as always. Actually, I got to go to a prom tonight. Uh, with, with Courtney. Shouts out to Courtney. She a cancer player. She's fighting cancer. She started school this year. Her senior, she got finished her senior year. And so her dream, you know, nobody went, well, nobody asked her to the um, prom. So I, I'm the lucky man going to take her to the prom tonight. That is amazing. Those are the things we like to hear about our Alabama guys. Now, are you going to be making the trip to New York? Oh, yeah, I'll be there. Most definitely I'll be there. It's a once in a lifetime thing. So most definitely I'll be there. Now there's one, two, three, four. How many guys? How, there's five of you going up to New York. It's five, and all of us hopefully will be in that first round. I, I, I think there's a pretty good chance. Now, we wish you the best of luck, Trent. Thanks for hanging out with us. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Back to you, Chris. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you, Trent. And yeah, uh, cancer survivor Courtney Alvis, Hueytown High School, uh, had uh, been diagnosed with leukemia. She has been fighting that, and... Uh, didn't think she was going to go to her senior prom, but she got quite the date off. <laughs> Trent Richardson. That's pretty cool. Who I believe, as an early enrollee, may have missed his prom. This may be his first one to get a chance to go to, but a great story and uh, best of luck to Courtney as she continues her battle with leukemia and, and wish her the best of success. She is the one that is uh, the real champion and the real fighter and, and uh, so happy she's getting an opportunity to experience Absolutely. that. You better take her somewhere nice to eat also. <laughs> I, think, I think he's going to be able to afford it. I think he can. I think he can. What a great young man and a great representative of the University of Alabama. Expected to go no lower than fifth in the draft. Expected to, in all likelihood, to go uh, fourth or fifth. Fourth with the Browns or fifth with the Buccaneers unless there is some sort of uh, trade that is made. But the top running back prospect in this year's draft, and he will have his name called very, very early. Tell you what, I'm not so sure that the, the star of this one so far hadn't been Cody Mandel. What a job he has done in handling the punting duties. A 57-yarder. He's had a 66-yard kick. And that one down inside the five. So 57 yards and with 22 seconds to go. Crimson team again will have an opportunity to maybe get themselves into field goal range. We'll see what the commissioner opts to do right here. Commissioner, coach, whatever role he opts to go with. Nick Saban. And his head in the huddle there for a moment. We'll see if they, you know, if this were regular season. Probably taking a knee right here or just trying to bullet forward to run the clock out, but probably a little bit different. Here to scrimmage with 50 seconds to go. Karen looking deep, looking for Kitty Bell again. Not able to get that separation from John Fulton that he had earlier that allowed him to come up with a big play inside the 10-yard line. Good coverage there from the Alabama defensive back. 
very good coverage by John Fulton. Stride for stride right down the sideline. Knew what Kenny Bell was wanting to do and absolutely would not allow any separation. Again, this is first team defense against first team offense. And the twos against the twos. So you're seeing the best of the best get after each other. You know, and that's a lot of pressure on John Fulton. Aha Clinton Dix rotates up, which puts uh, John Fulton really in just a one-on-one -on -one situation with no safety help. They put a little more time on the clock. The commissioner put it back to 50 seconds, I believe, from 22. And so now it ticks to 36 seconds. Nice read by A.J. McCarron. A little, little scissor crossing route there at the line of scrimmage. Man coverage. Robert Lester overcommitted to the outside and found a seam. That went batted away. Jesse Williams in the middle, able to get a paw up and knock that one away. And it stops the clock with 27 seconds remaining. Again, subject to change either way. <laughs> At one gentleman's discretion in the gray suit. Happened a couple of years ago. After time had expired, he gave them one, in a tie game. He gave one team an extra play, and that they converted, and that meant steak for somebody. And the ones eating beans weren't real happy about it. Karen stepping up, looking. Bell getting to the boundary and stopping the clock with 21 seconds to go. Karen just able to kind of sit back there. He got all the protection in the world there with that offensive line. Experienced guys. Good to see Cyrus Quanjo back out on the field. Quanjo suffering an E injury in the middle of last season and had to miss the, the latter half of the year. And that was a big loss for Alabama offensively. And that's the thing. Tackle to tackle right now. Your first team unit, Coach Saban, I think feels very good about it. But he's looking for some, some depth that can help them out. It's what allowed things to develop last year is on the receiving end, Brian Vogler. Those big tight end targets for the Crimson Tide. Able to reel that one in. When in doubt, throw it high to Vogler. He's 6'7", and he comes down with this pass. This guy just waiting, has been waiting his turn to get out on the field as he continues to fill out that big frame. See how big he is that Penny Sinceri took a running leap and still couldn't quite get up to his shoulders <laughs> on that attempt. Here's Hart. A little shake free from D. Milner, and then he tore the sideline. Deion Blue was able to push him, but even after that, Hart with that quickness was able to get around and get a couple more yards. It's a pretty good defender he shook off, too, in D. Milner. Yeah. Doesn't miss too many tackles. So now you're down to seven seconds. So if they get, they are going to try to run another play here. Crimson team with the 9-3 lead over the white squad. Karen looking for Jones, batted in the air and picked off. Intercepted by the white team and making the pick there was Ha Ha Clinton Dix. So the half comes to a close with a white squad coming up with a big play. Turning away the Crimson, their second interception of the first half. But it's the first team offense that's got the lead going into the break, 9-3. Coach Saban's Crimson team leading the white squad here on A Day in Tuscaloosa. On A Day at Bryant Denny Stadium, the Crimson team leading the white by a score of 9 to 3. I'm Chris Stewart along with Tyler Watson. First half, some good, some bad. Nothing really ugly, and I think that's what you try to avoid, I it guess, is. In something I, like look, this. I thought the defense looked great. No big plays other than the one Kenny Bell reception down the sideline that set up the only crimson touchdown of the day. So this defensive unit, especially in the secondary, has been pretty sound. Now, granted, they're going against the vanilla offense on both sides, but but they're still they're not. We're not seeing the mental breakdowns that traditionally you're going to see when you start substituting a lot of new guys working together. Somewhat vanilla. 
but not as much as a lot of places. We saw a lot of play action. We saw uh, some some hurry up. We saw some two minute both early in a quarter and obviously at the end of the half as well. Yes, as far as how the guys are working together, not feeling overwhelmed regardless of the situation, they're right in tune. They'll continue to get better over the course of the summer and in fall camp. But right now, there's not a phase of this football of this game that these players are, are really behind in. It's, it's just a matter of improving, which is what the coaching staff is looking for. Two young running backs, T.J. Yeldon, D. Hart, obviously something that are coming into this game. That's, that's what a lot of fans were looking toward. Yeah, and T.J. Yeldon has done a great job to this point, really lowering his shoulders when the opportunity arose, but also being able to get to the outside. When And he's taking advantage of this opportunity that he's given with Eddie Lacy being out. He's really looking good, and I think that this team will be able, if he's mentally there and able to come up with, with his pass protections, I think that he'll be able to contribute next year. And D. Hart, we saw right there before the half, what he's able to do when he gets in the open field with a football. He's so quick and is so explosive, he's going to be fun to watch. The opener against Michigan coming up. What an opportunity for the Crimson Tide to play a, a team of that caliber. And this is something Nick Saban has done since he's come to the university, playing a lot of games like this, where you, you open up against a big national power and you get an opportunity to see just how good you are right from the start. Yeah, in the neutral side as well. So it's not a home and home type deal. Great big venue on the national stage. It'll be a great one, especially with Michigan. Michigan right now feels pretty confident coming off an 11 and 2 season. And D. Hart, you think he's looking forward to it? Wants a commitment to Michigan. Backed out, came to the University of Alabama. You know that he's he's looking forward to that opportunity as well. This is a, the, the last tune up, if you will, I guess, uh, at least on the field of play. They'll have a lot of practices between now and that matchup at Cowboys Stadium again on September 1st. But we've got one half of A Day in the books. More still to come and more to look back on when we return right after this here on CSS, your source for Southeast Sports. Some of Bama's quarterback legends back here for a skills challenge, something that was initiated last year, the Brody Coyle showing that the arm strength still very much there. Tyler Watts a year ago participated in that. We got you in the booth. I got to take year. my glasses you off. You keep the shades on, you're fine. <laughs> you uh, you last year had a chance to participate in this. You had my arm video. hurt for three weeks after that as well. You got a couple of guys out here right now with Brody Curl and Andrew Zal. They're probably the only two quarterbacks down the field right now that can throw it 50 yards and hit that big prize. Uh, Stedman Sheely there. He should be running the option. Why, you know, he's he's throwing. I, I contend. He'll sue I'll, you for saying that. I, I'll contend, and, and I'll I'll get clarification from Stedman that he has thrown the ball more in this skills challenge the last couple of years than he did his entire time at the University of Alabama. Well, back there in the late 70s, Coach Bryant didn't let any of the quarterbacks throw the ball, did he? They, they threw it some, but they were throwing it out of that wishbone. So uh, that full stable of, of running backs. So great to see Stedman and uh, so many others. And again. These guys have made their mark at the University of Alabama. The guys that are out on the field today trying to make their mark, and there have been some here early that have done a nice job here on A-Day. Yeah, we're we're, we're kind of seeing the names of the future starting to, to be put at the forefront. Robert Lester, I mean, he's the name of the, of the past, but see him get back in that good form with the interception. If you're going to play at, at Alabama, you better have a good defense, and this year's defense is going to be salty. It's just they've lost a lot of experience. C.J. Mosley, the one that came in to record the safety, then the 48-yard field goal from Kate Foster. This may have been the play of the half right here. Great throw to the boundary and the great catch on the run by Christian Jones out of Minor High School to keep himself inbounds long enough to make that catch. Again, we saw some big plays. The defense coming up with some, as did the offense. Yeah, on both sides of the ball, uh, uh, just flashes of, of what we're to expect, I think, going forward, especially in that defensive secondary. The linebackers look solid. Defensive front has been able to apply pressure when they when they needed to and when they felt like it, when they weren't just trying to bat the ball down. Offensive line, though, for Alabama is going to be the strength of the offensive side as they continue to develop the backfield and the wide receivers. When we come back here on CSS, we'll take a look at some of the numbers from the first half. We will also have the uh, second half of play. Tyler's former teammate, Andrew Zow, almost took out Big Al a year ago. Still got it, along with some former Tide QBs down on the field here on A-Day. Here on A-Day 2012 in Tuscaloosa, I'm Chris Stewart along with Tyler Watts. First team offense, take it on first team defense, the offense wearing the crimson or the, uh, the first team unit, I should say, 
offense wearing the crimson. Eddie Lacy expected to be a part of that, but not going in today's game. He is still recovering from the, the surgery that he had during the offseason to uh, repair a, a, basically a turf toe injury that limited what he could do a season ago, but A.J. McCarron not limited in what he's doing today and certainly not limited after a great performance in the BCS championship game and leading the Crimson Tide to what is the school's 14th national crown. Lacey and McCarron expected to be key cogs in that offensive wheel that could be among the best in the country in the 2012 season that does indeed start on September 1st at Cowboys Stadium in Arlington, Texas against the Michigan Wolverines. Talked about McCarron, one of the great quarterbacks of the present, one of the greats of the past. Joins our Nikki Noto down on the sidelines. John Parker, you didn't hear this, but they just called you one of the greats of the past. And wow. you've been out of school how many years? I've been out of school three years now, and I wouldn't consider myself a great of the past. But that was that was a lot of fun we just did, seeing all the, uh, I guess, old quarterbacks now come back. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, pun intended with old, but you were the youngest one out there. So do you think you had a little bit of an advantage? Definitely, definitely. Luckily, Greg didn't come back. I guess they're starting camp next week. So it was fun to come out here. Some of these guys still got it, though. They've been out for like 30 years and still slaying it. So it was great. Andrew Zhao, I thought he was about to knock Big Al off that golf cart. I don't know what he was so angry at. He's trying to hurt him out there, just slinging it. But best arm I've ever seen, and he's still got it, obviously. So it was it was fun to watch. And obviously right now you're playing for the Atlanta Falcons along with Mike Johnson and Julio Jones. What's it been like having Julio out there at practice and throwing the ball around to him like the old days? It's fun. You know, I got to spend one year with him. When I was a senior, he was a freshman. So it's good to get him over. Hopefully we get some more Bama guys over there because – um, Julio's done a great job, and, and, and his future is definitely bright. All right. Well, thanks for hanging out with us, and enjoy the rest of the day. All right. Thanks. Back to you, Chris. Thanks, guys. And I stand by my comment. You look at the numbers. John Parker put up some phenomenal numbers oh, during yeah. his career and, and, again, went through some transitional periods. A, a guy with uh, tremendous talent. You don't lock onto an NFL roster as he has unless – You've got some really good skill, and it's great to see him get an opportunity to, to be a part of the Falcons organization. They are, you can tell, still extremely popular here in Tuscaloosa. I know the Falcons organization really likes him as well. And he can w say what he wants to about the old quarterbacks out there. He's one of them now, too, though. <laughs> at least he is in the minds of some of these guys out on the field today. Mr. Wilson, it's nice to see you again. <laughs> Another number 14 out there now. That's Phil Sims. And, they're going to rule that he was down. Jeffrey Pagan, number eight, a guy, Tyler, that people are excited about. Guy out of the state of Georgia, one of the top recruits from a year ago. 6'4", 285. Actually, I said Georgia, excuse me, out of uh, Asheville, North Carolina. And a guy who had offers from Georgia and other schools all over the country. Could have gone anywhere, but uh, a big part of what Alabama's looking forward to here in 2012. Has the size, has the tools to develop into something really special for this uh, Alabama front four. On third and ten, Sims able to elude the rush initially and dump it off to his tight end. Harrison Jones making the grab. That's going to be well shy of the first down and they'll have to punt it away. Again, that first half, the punting numbers Awfully impressive. Cody Mandel. I think he averaged. Well, let's see. He punted better for the white team than he did for the Crimson. How about, or for the uh, the Crimson than he did the white. Four punts, an average of 47 and a half yards when he was lined up for the Crimson side with a long of 66. He had a 57-yard long and a 43-yard average when kicking for the white team. He split the duties. It was the Sandlot. So the quarterback for both teams. He's the punter for both teams. He certainly has done the job, and we talk about it somewhat lightly. But if Alabama is able to take that next step in what they do in special teams, that's another thing that takes a little pressure off of a defense that's not expected to be maybe as dominant as last year's, even though it's going to be very, very good once again. And we can also, at that point, take off the table. What if the offense was able to get one more uh, first down and move the chains a little bit further and get that field position that is oh so important against some of the likes like LSU and what Michigan will be in the open. Away 59-yard punt. He's had a 57-yarder and a 66-yarder today. So heck of a job for Mandel as that first-team offense works against the first-team defense. Grims inside. Here you see Mandel.
Missouri, a Lafayette, Louisiana native. And I said, we wouldn't see Eddie Lacy. And I'm right, that is indeed 4 5. <laughs> Pick set of number 42, but Karen just unloading that one. Pressure coming. We have a flag. Crimson side was looking for one, but no laundry on the turf at the moment. David Smith was also telling AJ, be very careful when you throwing the ball away inside the pocket. And it is a teaching opportunity, and the officials take part in that as well. Third and about eight. And the big tight end. Michael Williams first catch that he has had. How much did he improve late in the season last year, especially in that national championship game? What? This is an offense. The philosophy designed by Nick Saban. But you had Jim McElwain as the play caller the last few years and now moving on becoming the head coach at Colorado State. Now with Doug Nussmeyer after three years at the University of Washington as the offensive coordinator, you'll, you'll see a little bit of his philosophy mixed in. And, and Coach Saban likes that. He loves the continuity. It's good to have, but he also likes to see new ideas yeah. coming onto that staff every couple of years so that they make sure that they don't get stale and they're able to add some new things uh, to what they're doing in, in those coaches' meetings as well. Absolutely, because you think about it, every coach, every defensive coordinator in the SEC right now is thinking, all right, they got a new coordinator. How are they going to change what they do? How do we go back? Do we start studying Washington? You, you can't just continue to build on, on how you're going to play against this Alabama offense. Sims, I think, had been wrapped up, and they will indeed credit Wilson Love with the sack right there. So a loss of a few yards. Schedule another challenge for the Crimson Tide. You've got Michigan to start the year, and you'll come home for the regular season home opener against Western Kentucky before moving into league play in that third week in Fayetteville against Arkansas. And Yeldon, boy, a little stutter step, and then you saw the acceleration to get across the 40 to about the 42-yard line. But you got road trips within the league to Arkansas, Missouri, Tennessee, Baton Rouge. Another challenging schedule when you got Horses like this one that can run for you it can certainly make things look, I won't say easier, but you feel good about going against anybody right now. Yeah, you're right about that. Danny Woodson Jr., another guy, haven't called his name much, though, doing a great job blocking on that previous play. Yelled at the boy able to get to that corner and turn it up in a hurry. That's another first down. All right, here's Woodson again, number 81. Doing a great job coming up, allowing Yelding to get to the outside. 15 now, yards on that carry. His dad was a quarterback here in the late 80s, early 90s, I want to say. Are we going to have to tag the junior on the end of that every time? Yes, we for, get for people like me that, that remember We'll Danny get confused, Woods. huh? We'll, we'll get confused, but make sure we pay it, pay it homage to the past and the present. How about yeah. that? Nice throw by Sims. With traffic, with the ball on the turf. And I believe that was indeed Danny Woodson that made the catch and then lost the handle. They're fighting for steaks and beans down there. You better believe there's a battle going on at the bottom of the pile. The winning team gets staked, the losing team. It's pork and beans. It's not the same. But they are going to get possession to the white squad. A 9-3 game in favor of the Crimson. 
Ones against ones, twos against twos in this format. With a running clock in the second and third, or in the uh, first and third quarters, and a nice stop made defensively. Boy, there's some strength there from LaMichael Fanning to be able to bring Yeldon down basically with one hand. And this was amazing because Fanning fought his way in the backfield, but it looked like Yeldon was going to be able to get out of his grasp as he continued to go to the outside. But I think, I think Fanning is another one of those guys, though. You've called his names in spots in the last couple of years, but now he's going to get even a bigger role and a bigger opportunity to play more and more downs for this defensive unit. Sims with a nice throw, a nice catch, and an even nicer result. Chris Black, the wide receiver, making the grab in traffic. And Tyler, great to see Phil Sims have some success in a scrimmage. A guy who was the backup a year ago, limited somewhat by injuries in spring drills, but a nice throw there, and then Black able to turn on the speed to find the end zone. That, that, that play right there showed great patience by Sims, not only for waiting for, for Black to be able to come open, but as well as he hasn't had been able to throw the ball downfield all afternoon, but continue to look, continue to look, and be patient. 44-yard touchdown strike, Chris Black, the 5'11 freshman out of Jacksonville High School's first Coast High School, making the grab from Phillip Sims as the white team has now taken a 10-9 lead. Kickoff. As we take a look at what really counts for the Alabama Crimson Tide. It's an 8 game, a lot of fun, but the real schedule starts on September 1st. The Michigan Wolverines expected to be two top 25 squads that will meet. Again, with things somewhat in flux in Fayetteville right now. You don't know what you'll find, but you do. You'll find an extremely talented team in the Razorbacks to start conference play. A really challenging schedule two out of those first three weeks. It does, not to mention the fact that you're adding on Missouri, who's an unknown in this league at this point, having to go to Columbia and play them, as well as Texas A&M coming to Tuscaloosa this year. Road trip to Baton Rouge. And then finishing things up here in Tuscaloosa against the Auburn Tigers. It just doesn't seem like that long ago. 11 was the max that you played, and short time before that, it was 10. It just continues to grow and grow, and the quality of the opponent continues to increase, it seems. McCarran on play action. Able to unload that one. Nice grab made by Michael Williams right at that first down marker. Get a guy of that size with that type of athletic ability. Michael Williams, a special talent, I think, to tie it in. Really is, and that's that's not an easy catch as your body's taking you back towards the inside of the field, towards the center, and the ball's thrown to the outside because that's where all the space is and able to adjust your momentum and get going in that direction. 6'6", 270. Now to reform Alabama, Pickens County native, making that grab and move the chains again for the Crimson squad. Now trailing 10 and 9, McCarran. Tried to step away from Adrian Hubbard, but big defender was able to reel him in and make the stop. That is a sack again at contact as the quarterbacks are not available to be leveled. It's, it's, did you did you appeal to try to get black jerseys worn? In a game? Play, in a game? In a game, there was times you definitely would have loved for that to have been the case, especially running the option. It would have been nice. Adrian Hubbard's a guy that you're going to call his name and really notice him this year as he continues to fill out. He has all the tools of a speed rusher, but is getting physical and able to play that, that down jack linebacker position. Almost got the sack there. And McCarran showing good speed and showing very good restraint. Ha ha Clinton Dix, who had the interception at the end of the half. You know he wanted to light up the quarterback there, but able to lay off of him. McCarron putting him in a little better position. Take a look at the replay and again Hubbard again not necessarily the prototype that long ranging body that he has but awfully awfully strong. But he's gained about 30 pounds since he arrived on campus a little over two years ago. 
and is kind of filling into that. But he's a guy that doesn't want to get too big because he wants to be able to utilize his background and being able to move and being flexible and flying around the football field. And that's that's a difficult challenge for an offensive tackle to be able to take on those long arms that prevent him from being able to go in there and lock up Adrian and be able to use those, those moves and that speed to get around these offensive linemen. And we just saw it in two plays. You saw the strength of being able to rush against a down an offensive lineman and, and able to get to a quarterback. And then he's able to go in coverage of a running back out of the backfield. 6'6", 250 pounds. Adrian Hubbard. Another guy who had a role last year, but a bigger one this year is Chris Black, who had the touchdown grab on the previous drive, fielding that punt. CSS brings you over 80 live college baseball games. Visit css-sports.com to view the full schedule featuring some of the best teams and matchups in the country. Stewart, Tyler Watts with you, along with our sideline reporter, Nikki Noto. Glad to have you with us here on CSS for 8A 2012 at the University of Alabama. The Crimson and the white teams squaring off. About three and a half minutes to go in the third quarter as Phillip Sims again at quarterback just threw a 44-yard pass for a touchdown, but that one dropped by Brent Calloway. So he had defenders on his back. It'll be second and ten. How do you handle success? That, that seems to be kind of an ongoing theme around here in Tuscaloosa recently. You get a lot of opportunities yeah, to learn, do. don't you? Get you get plenty, and, and that's what uh, what Sims, Philip Sims, is kind of ha having on this drive is a great touchdown play, but how do you respond offense? Do you, do you set the tone again and move the ball, or do you sit there on last, last drive? Yelled it again on the carry, just pulling tacklers and kid it. It's amazing to think this young man just a few months ago while the Crimson Tide was working their way into the BCS championship game, he was in a high school state championship contest and one of those early enrollees who looks physically ready to step in and contribute from day one. Yeah, but because he's so tall, though, he's deceptively big. He, he, he doesn't look filled out in... 230 pounds. Well, he's not, but he's still 215, 216. That's a big body for a running back. Daphne High School product. Able to shake off one tackle and then change direction. A nice seven or eight yard pickup on first down there. Seeing patience, too, for a running back. You know, letting things develop and then the, the explosiveness to find that hole once it opens up. A lot of that comes from great instincts as long as well as being coachable and listening and and learning from from the reps that you do have and you're right uh, he's he's been awfully impressive 83 yards today Burton Burns running backs coach associate head coach he's done a wonderful job of developing some great talent that's been brought in as the pass is caught another tight end Malcolm Fashion able to able to make that grab. Fashion, a 6'5", 260-pound redshirt freshman out of Picayune, Mississippi, played at Picayune Memorial High School. Highly sought-after player from recruiting class a couple of years ago and redshirted last season and now contributing here in spring ball and getting ready for the start of 2012. On first and ten, Sims dumping that one off, and there's Yeldon again. Shaking free from one man. It's a foot race, and I think he's going to win it. He does indeed. A touchdown for the white team as they extend their lead 50 yards. On the little dump off from Sims to Yeldon, and he knew what to do with it after he got the ball in the open field. It's just a little crossing route. Phillip Sims once again being patient. Yeldon's going to kind of sneak out of the backfield and see the crossing. Right here, though, is where the confusion happened. Travell Dixon had, had the look at him. It was a nice, strong stiff arm by Yeldon. Kate Foster booting that one through. 
And so now it is a 17 to nine lead late in the third quarter. The white squad, which had trailed at the half, now putting together back-to-back -to -back touchdowns. Phillip Sims connecting first with Chris Black and now with T.J. Yeldon. And able to give the white squad an eight-point advantage. 45 seconds to go here in the third quarter of play. But this is good, isn't it, Chris? All right, you got two things going on. First, your first team offense hasn't done much of anything here in the second half. So A.J. McCarrion and guys will, will play from behind and, and feel a little pressure to move the ball and put points on the board. And, and adversely, the, the Crimson defense, two scoring drives on two consecutive possessions. That's not something that you see a lot around here. We have to ask that man if it's a good thing or not. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to guess he's not trying to be about the score. I'm trying to be optimistic. You're doing a good job of it. I think the fans, though, have been able to see some things that they wanted to, which is what a big part of A Day actually happens to be for the fans themselves. And something Coach Saban has, has talked about a number of times that first spring practice that first A-Day experience 2007 when he made his initial appearance here at the Capstone. The phenomenal crowds that turned out more than 92,000 basically obliterating what had been the national record for a spring football game by more than 20,000. And when he saw a beyond capacity Bryant Denny Stadium at that time, that's when he knew this could really, really, really be something special. Speaking of, number one, D. Hart on the carry. Able to work his way across midfield. You know what's going to happen. There's going to be talk tonight, tomorrow already because of the internet. Trent who? Just as it was with Mark Ingram. The school's only Heisman Trophy winner. The position is in good hands, even though you don't have one single guy that can do what a Trent Richardson did. Little flea flicker here as McCarron looks deep for Kenny Bell. He is there, and the catch is made. Touchdown. Beautiful throw and catch. 47 yards on the flea flicker. And the Crimson team. Not giving away that stake just yet. The final play of the third quarter. They pulled it in two. Talk about explosive. There's no way I thought Kenny Bell was going to be able to run this ball down. But A.J. threw it the only place he could because Vinny Sinceri was closing so quickly. And they will go for two here to try to tie it up at 17. Again, the Crimson squad. The first team offense working against the first team defense in white. A player late coming off the field for the white team as McCarron will try to throw it short and bat it away by Fulton. So the two point conversion attempt fails. The defense turning him away. And the white team able to get the stop. They had some big plays offensively in the third quarter. Freshman T.J. Yeldon, quarterback Phillip Sims, wide receiver Chris Black helping the White squad take a two-point lead as we head to the fourth. Tyler Watts, Nicky Noto back with you here at Bryant-Denny Stadium in Tuscaloosa as the Crimson team has pulled within two. But the White squad still has the lead as we begin the fourth quarter of what is the final practice of the spring. The awards will be handed out afterwards. See again coming out for the white team, Philip Ely. He and Philip Sims splitting time for that second team offense. And again, because of being a little bit banged up, Philip Sims not able to go as much during the spring, but I think we've seen some very good things from him in this A Day game as the coaches have throughout the course of spring ball. Uh, absolutely, and, and, and a lot of it just has to do with the fact that man, he's a competitor. I mean, he is absolutely a competitor. A freshman last year, didn't play much at all. 
cleanup duty only sticks around Phil still feels confident in what he's able to do out here on the field and being able to compete it says a lot about his character and about him Ben Howell the running back now for the tide along with Ely the quarterback pressure coming but able to unload it and just beyond the reach of his intended receiver, that was Marvin Shin, another one of those wide outs from down in South Alabama. A red shirt, 6'3", 200 pounds, out of Viger High School, down in Pritchard. Some great talent coming out of that area over the years, in particular that Viger program. Teach a lot of things. You can't teach a guy to be 6'3, 200 at a wideout. Otherwise, we'd have a lot of them. You absolutely would. But it's great to see those guys that, that look the mold and then you can develop them as passes dumped off to Howell at the backfield. A couple of guys there to make the stop. Travell Dixon among them. We talk about certain guys that may not be the prototype in, in certain positions. There are spots where it is really good to have a wide out at the moment. You definitely want and need it, uh, especially in this style where you've got to be a good blocker. You have to be physical and be able to go downfield and put some punishing looks. But also, you're right, you got to fit the mold. Mandel having this one fielded by Hart. I'll tell you something else that we've seen while it looks as though Christian Jones is going to be the, the primary punt return guy or at least maybe the leader of the clubhouse right now. you got a lot of options there also. And the most important thing, Chris, is you, you got three or four guys that can get back there and at the very least they can field the football. And that's number one. If it's bouncing off your chest, off your face mask, and it's a turnover, what good are you out there? And, and all the guys that, that Alabama's put out there D, with D Hart and, and also Baloo seem to be have it have that natural ability to not be intimidated by high ball coming in very slowly and, and a bunch of guys running at them. A lot of wind today here at the stadium as well about a 15 mile per hour breeze that can wreak havoc with it as Karen will be marked down at the 40 yard line. Just joining us again the black no contact jerseys worn by the quarterbacks today. of an eye opener was it that first time you you go through wearing the black jersey and then all of a sudden you get clocked it's not there <laughs> it's like you wait a minute bring it give me that back yeah. again hard again on the carry and he'll have the first down and almost a whole lot more then trade a priest that Perhaps save the touchdown, but boy, you see the vision. And a guy with great speed, but a guy also that not afraid to run in traffic is actually Nico Johnson that made the stop on him. He's shy of six foot tall, but you're right. He's he's not scared to lower his shoulder pads either and try to pick up that extra tough yard. Tremendous high school career out of Dr. Phillips High School in Orlando. 5'9, 190. Still first down. So with 11 16 to go in fourth quarter, after penalties, the clock stops, and inside of four minutes, the clock will stop as well. Otherwise, a running clock. Until we get to that four minute mark. Hart. I believe it was Stinson that delivered the hit. So now second and nine for McCarran and company as the Crimson team trails 17-15 in this 8A game with stakes on the line. 
He'll swing that one out. Catch is made across the way by Nathan McAllister. Another new wide out for the Crimson Tide. Say new. He is a senior who was on the squad, but seeing action here at 5'11", 165 out of Russellville High School in Russellville, Alabama. It's a big third down play here. If you're the Crimson team, you don't want to give this back to the white squad and give them a chance to extend that lead. Looking across the middle, has his man, and the catch is made, or is it? No, it's dropped. Tried to connect with Kevin Norwood. Had a couple of great grabs in the BCS title game, but not able to hang on to that one with, I believe, Deion Blue in coverage. Would have been a really nice catch by Norwood. Right. He had some absolutely amazing catches there in that championship game. That's one he also feels he should have caught. High booming kick for Mandel, but this one will carry into the end zone. It's had that breeze at his back and it carried it into the end zone for a touchback. So the white team will try to add to the lead when we come back to Tuscaloosa midway through the fourth here on A-Day. For Philip Ely, the quarterback of the white team, trying to add to their lead, T.J. Yeldon getting stood up. And now you've got second team offense versus second team defense. And you better believe those Crimson defenders are hearing it from the offense. Get us the yeah. ball back. We're down, we're down a couple with a stake on the line and under eight to go. Ely trying to dump it off to Yellow, but that's a nice job in coverage by C.J. Mosley. That Crimson defense does exactly what they needed to. Is force a three and out and get the offense back to ball with pretty good field position. It's where, it's where the Crimson side may have a little bit of an advantage because there are so many guys that play, you know, they may be listed as second team in the case of Mosley, but he was a key contributor oh. last year. So there's there's a lot of battle-tested guys for that Crimson side, but they have also found themselves on the wrong end of that 17-15 score as Mandel again moves one away. And even though he was wearing a white jersey, Leon Blue on the return after the 41-yard punt for the Crimson side. So McCarron, who has worked with the first team offense all day, brings them back out again from the 45. Clock moving under seven minutes to go. Justin Fowler, one of the first carries we've seen from him in a while. That's his seventh carry of the day, though. And this is what's always so fun, in my opinion, about watching this football team over the last couple of years is, is you see a play like what Justin Fowler just did, just a run up the middle, and it doesn't look like it gets much. And there's such a push, though, by the offensive line. It's, it's a four- or five-yard game. The plays that, that don't seem like much that get you five yards on, on first down especially make a lot of hay. Kelly Johnson tied in, making that grab. White team territory, but still shy of the first down mark. Johnson, one of the guys battling for playing time at tight end. He's a senior, 6'3", 230. Uh, South Carolina. Third and right at four yards. 
Norwood and Bell, the wide outs to the top of your picture. Fowler, the single setback. McCarron swinging it to Vogler. And the big tight end has got the first down before he is swung down on the play by Nico Johnson. So first down for the Crimson. I like clock continues to run. And I like how Brian Vogler, after he catches this little short pass, he wastes no time. He knows he's right at the marker. And he just lowers that shoulder and knows if he can just fall forward half a yard, that it's a first down. Nico Johnson's not a little guy. I mean, Nico goes 6'3, 245, but then you look at Vogler at 6'6 and a bunch. That is tough to bring down when he's got the momentum going forward. And a mix up there as the pass falls incomplete. Might also have been a case of McCarron not thinking he had quite as much time as he actually did. Benny Sinceri was coming on the safety blitz. Got picked up well. Give a lot of credit to the backfield for Alabama. I think D. Hart was in there in order to pick that up. Now it's Jostin Fowler. I apologize. Karen's thrown a couple of picks today, but he's 23 of 33, I believe, for about 260 yards. And he's pretty good in control. Uh, he, he absolutely is. I mean, he knows what he's doing with the football. And after you get a year or two under your belt, you start trying to push the envelope to find out exactly where that boundary is. Sometimes uh, it results in a couple of interceptions in practice. But he's going against one of the better defensive backfields that he's going to face. So, the, you know, the, we forget. those holes are going to close a lot quicker here Absolutely. and in practice than they are on Saturdays in the fall. We forget. Yeah, he, he is indeed going against. And okay, that's why this team has gotten better and better and better. The competition they yeah. face each day in practice has gotten better and prepares them for Saturdays. But another third and long here with the clock ticking under four minutes to go and the Crimson team down a couple. McCarron trying to buy some time. Pressure coming from Williams and it falls incomplete. So now let's see what Commissioner Nick Saban instructs the Crimson team to do. Looks like they're going to punt it away with 3.30 to go. A little pressure on that Crimson defense to get the ball back. And the clock's stopping now. Regular game type situations as well. So there's absolutely no reason if a, uh, another three and out occurs that Crimson could not have an opportunity with 45, 50 seconds left to try to win this football game. Chris Black back to return this one, but like the move to just call a fair catch and make it inside 15. A good pooch punt from Cody Mandel as the white team will take over. And of course at CSS, we know football doesn't stop when the games do. Here in the South, college football is year round and you can tune in to the college football fix. That's every week for the latest updates and interviews. The college football fix Mondays and Fridays at 6.30 Eastern here on CSS. 27 yard punt for Mandel, but it got the job done. Putting the white team back inside their own 15 as the give is to Yeldon. Play it pretty conservative right here, I would imagine. You just want to try to run that clock down as much as possible. You know, those true game situations that you just alluded to, using timeouts here now. The first of three. Didn't have 90,000 here today. But you had a bunch. And I think they got an opportunity to see that the talent that was back from a year ago is even better. And that the talent that's been signed is every bit as good as advertised. And there's more coming, of course, in the fall as they dump it off to Yeldon with room across the 30. And they'll spot him around the 36-yard line, and that'll move the chains and keep possession for the white team with 3.06 left to play. T.J. Yeldon's pretty impressive when he gets in open field. It's just so explosive in getting up, up to speed. I mean, it doesn't take him but a step or two, and he's full throttle. 
19 yards on the pickup. And I tell you what, the white team is not sitting back and waiting. They are in attack mode right now. They're going with their two minute offense, even with a two point lead. As treated as though they're down a couple. Philip Ely able to unload a couple of passes. There's Harrison Jones on that catch after Chris Black caught the previous one. And why not? Why, why not put your guys in this opportunity? It's not about the game for Nick Saban. It's about getting better. And that's what they're trying to do here. Ely looking up top. Got a man. Catch is made of Ari Cooper, but a flag's going to come in. He may have stepped out of bounds. He may have pushed off, or he may just have a big completion. We'll wait see what the official ruling is. Cooper battling step for step with Bradley Silf. Yeah, that may be all the push. The push. Yeah, yeah, but it looked mutual. There wasn't much of a push there. <laughs> Have you sided with the defense? Pass interference on the offense, number nine. That penalty is 15 yards. Replay first down. Chris, they hold relentlessly. I'm not arguing with you. I just yes, ask you if are you've ever, as the me. former quarterback, if you've ever sided with the defense before. Okay. Well, well, I'm with us. Just checking. You know, I've done a few games together, and I didn't recall that happening. But, and you may have been right every time. I just asked. <laughs> I like the aggressiveness, though. Lamari doing a nice job. What's, what's the uh, rule of thumb? It's not a penalty unless it's called. Absolutely. But unfortunately for Cooper, the white team, it was indeed called there. So they'll back him up 15 yards, still 2.24 to go. The white team with a lead, but trying to work on their two minute offense. Pressure coming and a sack reported. Jeffrey Hagan was there, and also Xavier Dixon, who's linebacker, stepping up and making contact as Crimson will use another timeout here, stopping the clock with 2.17 to go. Seems like we were just in the Superdome in New Orleans with the confetti falling and the national champions for 2011 being crowned. Here we are with spring practice, and before you know it, we'll be at Cowboy Stadium in Arlington, Texas on September 1st, Alabama opening 2012 campaign against the Michigan Wolverines. Ely trying to avoid a heavy rush. Able to buy himself some time, and the catch is made by Cooper. Nope, they're going to say he's out of bounds. And it's incomplete. Saw some elusiveness, though, from number 12. He can move around. Yeah, he, he's, he, he is pretty going to be fun to watch in a broken down situation, what he's able to do, because he can definitely buy himself an extra couple of seconds of time. There's only a small percentage of programs around the country that will have 78,000 plus for any of their home football games this year. Alabama. 78,500 and some change for their annual spring game here on an absolutely beautiful Saturday afternoon in Tuscaloosa. The numbers were just handed out. I think 78,526 may be the official number for today's attendance. Another terrific crowd, something that Coach Saban and his staff encourage. They love seeing the big numbers. The number of recruits come in and are usually taken aback by the the great support from the Alabama fan base. Again, it's just a scrimmage at a lot of places, but it's another opportunity to come to the capstone for Alabama fans. And an opportunity for a lot of people who, who don't normally get a chance. But you're right. I think, I think the majority of these fans now feel obligated. They, they feel that they're letting the program and the players down if they don't come and support them the way that they need to. Well, they want to be a part of it. They want to contribute. And they know this is a way that they can. And a tip of the hat to athletic director Mal Moore and, and uh, the athletic administration. This is a free ball game. There's no admission charge. There's concession sales, but there's no admission charge for this. It's a way that the athletic department wants to give back. And as you said, giving people an opportunity that may not be able to get tickets for a game in the fall to come here, experience the stadium with their families, and, and uh, see the Alabama Crimson tied in action as Vinny Sinceri will go for the scoop and score. I don't believe they're going to mark it down. The commissioner always has the option to overrule, but I believe you've got a fumble and Sinceri, Vinny Sinceri, 
scooping up the loose football and taking it for a touchdown. Michael Williams fighting for the extra yards, but the defense definitely, they're trying to strip it away. Yep. Was it Ballou? I think it was. Ballou and Ha Ha Clinton Dix able to strip that ball away for Sinceri. The whistle didn't blow. The touchdown is scored, and with a minute 16 to go, the white team a step closer to stakes rather than beans. As again, booting it through is Cade Foster. So now it's a 24 to 15 lead. 21 yards on the fumble recovery by Vinny Sinceri. Give the white team that nine point advantage. Are you tired of the same old sports talk? Well, tune in to Sports Night for a unique perspective that's informative, controversial, and yes, entertaining. Watch the biggest mouths in the South. Talk it up on Sports Night. That's weeknights at 6 Eastern on CSS. Apologies to Bob Neal and crew. I read it the way it was written. Biggest mouse in the South. <laughs> now, white team, you're, you're enjoying things at this point. Just sit back and relax a little bit. You know it. You know, first of all, spring practice is almost done. It looks like you're going to get bragging rights, but you're in panic mode somewhat if you're on the Crimson side, right? Not a whole lot you can do right now other than score extremely quick and hope that he gives you one more opportunity. Again, Commissioner can overrule a minute 16 with him on your side. Could indeed be awfully big. Could be a lot of time. It seems like the Crimson's called two timeouts this half, haven't they? They did. They have at least one, we'll say, at their disposal. As Martin will fill this one inside the five. TJ Yeldon, 16 carries for almost 90 yards and then five catches for 90 more and a touchdown. Boy, he is certainly among the candidates to be an MVP in this game, A.J. McCarron, very solid day. I thought Phillip Sims looked awfully good, and you see the numbers for Vinny Sinceri as well. Yeah, Sinceri's done a great job this afternoon, really flying up around the football. Only got beat deep one time on the Kenny Bell touchdown. So he's running that secondary nice. All right. Picking up good yardage after the catch. I'll tell you what, again, the thing that among the things you're trying to build now if you're Alabama depth, you know basically who your front line guys are. There are some spots that are still trying to be filled, but you're trying to build depth as you move towards the start of 2012. And I, I think you've seen at a lot of different positions where that's taking place, even though you got the ball on the turf a couple more times than Nick Saban would like to see. And, and that's the biggest thing is, is who can you trust to put in the football game and, and not get you beat first and foremost, but then who has the ability to go out there and make some plays? and. We've seen a lot of guys really elevate, uh, you know, the possibilities of, of, of getting some quality playing time in the upcoming season. A, because they're not doing anything stupid to beat their football team, and they're making plays on top of that. McCarron with a lot of time. And Norwood getting out of bounds to stop the clock. 48 seconds left to go in this one. Vinny Sinceri. Again, his father, Sal. Part of Coach Saban's staff. For a couple of seasons, and now in Knoxville as a defensive coordinator under Derek Dooling. Vinny said, this is my school, this is home. He actually finished his high school career in Tuscaloosa. A big part of Bama's defensive plans. Virtually the same play in Orwood. This time, not able to get out of bounds. And the clock will continue to run, forcing the Crimson to use its final timeout. And I won't say their final timeout because, again, the Kamish could always hand them another one, but it was the last guaranteed timeout for the Crimson uh, squad.
down nine with 39 seconds to go. Karen directing traffic. Trying to find somebody deep. Instead, we'll have to dump it off. A nice grab. Staying in bounds. D. Harden. Again, the talent level in the backfield. Tyler in, in the different type looks each guy's going to throw at you. We didn't see Eddie Lacy, but we know what he can do. Justin Fowler, again, versatile, but no primarily as, as the bull. You've got Yeldon, who looks like he's got some bull to him, but he can absolutely burn as well. And D. Hart, just blazing speed out of the backfield as Sinceri gets another pick. <laughs> he will elude A.J. McCarron, and I think he will indeed take this one to the house. Oh, he's going to take a knee at the five. Oh, he got tackled back at the 40. Okay. They'll, they'll give McCarron credit for the tackle. But another big play by Sinceri on the defensive side late in this game. And, and just a situation. It looked like Norwood might have even slowed up a little bit on his route. So, you know, a lot of work that can be done in the film room still and learn. But yeah, any questions about how Sinceri would run this secondary? I think he's done a pretty good job. Tough young man. With some pretty good speed and pound for pound, maybe the biggest hitter on the team. So now the final 13 seconds. Does the white team get to go in victory formation? Four handoff, Ben Howell on the carry. Picks up a couple of yards. And it looks like State for the team in white. They win A Day 2012. Head coach Nick Saban seeing his first team defense and second team offense pick up a 24 15 win against the Crimson Squad. Some bragging rights for a while. And then all eyes will move towards September 1st. Cowboys Stadium, Alabama, taking on the Michigan Wolverines. Down on the field, Alabama head coach Nick Saban joining our Nikki Noto. All right, Coach, so when we spoke this week, you said today was all about improving and putting the pass behind. Now that A-Day is in the books, what areas of your team do you think needs the greatest improvement? Well, you know, there's obviously a lot of areas that we can work on, but spring, spring games are about players going out and competing, showing their ability to execute. It's almost like taking a final exam for the end of spring practice and see which guys made the improvement that could play winning football. And I saw a lot of guys do a lot of good things today, but there's a lot of areas that we can definitely improve on. Are you any closer to discovering that new identity for this new team? Well, you know, I think that's up to the team. I think they all have to make a choice and decision about that. And it's something they have to go earn, and everybody needs to understand that it's going to be tough for them. And everybody's got to make a commitment to it. It's not automatic. Thanks a lot, Coach. All right, thank you. That's it for A-Day. Back to you guys in the booth. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Nikki. And the white team does indeed get the 24-15 to 15 victory. But, again, you can tell the wheels very much turning Coach Saban's mind, looking towards what's got to take place as the team goes into its off-season conditioning program. They get themselves ready, and next thing you know, they'll be, be showing up yeah. and getting ready for September 1st. It's amazing how quickly it will, it will happen, how time will fly by, and we'll be in the fall before you know it. That's going to wrap things up from Tuscaloosa as it has been a successful spring for head coach Nick Saban's squad. Some of the past coming out to see the future of the Crimson Tide. For Tyler Watts and Nicky Noto, I'm Chris Stewart saying thanks for joining us as the white team defeats the Crimson 24-15. Now stay tuned for more sports right here on CSS.